Uh, welcome to the extraordinary meeting of Horizons in the United States. And I'm really happy to present all of our Transparency, explainability and black box problem, privacy and accessibility, and disinformation and eco chamber. But at the same time, new decentralization in open data projects, open emotional AI, and hiring social robots in autism or special education learning, AI and drug research, or nursing practice, practice so many amazing projects. Uh, first of all, I would love to present myself. I chair this uh, meeting. Um, my name is Jonah Welker, and I'm focused on the future of neurodiversity, uh, assistive technology, and disability. I try to connect the dots of this industry on many levels. On one hand, uh, on venture capital level, I'm collaborating with 500 startups, European Commission, and INSEAD. At the same time, I'm dealing with AI ethics community, uh, and I empowered many projects in this field. At the same time, I'm working in research fields, specifically on uh, the field of algorithmic diversity and creation of more uh, niche-focused solutions for assistive technology, uh, autism, dyslexia, and other problems. And at the same time, I'm working on in order to empower zero exclusion and democratization of AI. J uh, recently, I'm joined Women in AI in US and I work with MIT uh, in order to democratize hackathons focused on AI technology. Uh, today we have a great guest and uh, each of us present particular experience like Ben Gertzel from SingularityNet, a uh, so experienced researcher who will be able to come up with a perspective on decentralization and beyond. Rana Gujral from Behavioral Signals, um, super successful. Uh, business person, uh, emotional AI, customer service, and business experience. He will be able to come up with so many ideas for business leaders. Uh, Hussein Al Mahmoudi uh, from from Sharjah Research. Um, it's very close uh, to me because uh, he will be able to come up with perspective related to technology transfer, innovation parks, incubators, uh, intersection of a uh, public policy and innovation, but also uh, business leaders. And finally, uh, Dr. Armen Orujan, uh, presenting foundation for Armenian science uh, in technology. So today, I would love to ask the following question to all of us. And I hope you will be come up with a different perspective related to this question. So the question is, how pandemic accelerator, accelerated changes driven by AI technology and how business leaders, public leaders, uh, businesses, startups, able to leverage these challenges, still balancing progress with the impact, transparency, human rights and ethics and Ben, could you be, be please our first expert who contribute your perspective? Don't forget to present yourself better because maybe I missed something. Let's start. Sure, thanks a lot. Um, I'm Ben Gertzel. I'm an AI researcher since uh, I got my PhD in the late, late 1980s. I've been doing both applied AI across pretty much all of the application areas there are, as well as pushing toward artificial general intelligence, what I call AGI. And in, in, the, in the last few years, I've been leading a project called SingularityNet, which is a blockchain-based AI marketplace aimed at providing valuable AI services and, and catalyzing the provision of AI services in various niches by, by many third parties, and also aimed at sort of catalyzing the emergence of of AGI by the by the combination of AI components contributed by 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 multiple people and obviously the pandemic has been a big deal for our own business and our own corner of the AI world at, at Singularity Net along along with that with everyone else's and we can see a number of impacts the pandemic has had on on artificial intelligence some of them pretty obvious some of them more subtle i mean with with everyone living more of their life 
online. I mean, there's more data that goes to online services, so there's more data to feed AI, right? And, uh, you know, face-to-face -face interactions in some cases are, are still a weakness for AI when you get rid of them and more interactions are digital. You're often putting more interactions in a domain where, where current AIs can can excel because they, they don't need to read someone's gestures or their tone of voice. The person's just like submitting an order for something in, 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 a, in a form in a form anyway. I mean, in the in a robotics context, I mean, intelligent robotics sometimes can enable human contact. Can it can it can enable physical interaction by a business without human contact that could spread a virus, right? So, I mean, the, if you if you if you're ordering food, you you, you would rather not have a, have a person do it. You'd, you'd rather just ha have an AI interact via via voice or some sanitary touchpad or something. And you know, in in medicine. We've been working in Singularity Net with Hanson Robotics on a project called Awakening Health. And so we have a humanoid robot called Grace, which is like the little sister of the better known humanoid robot, Sophia. And, you know, Grace is a nursing assistant oriented toward elder care. So you mentioned autism. Hanson Robotics has done some things with robotics for autism therapy. And that's also very valuable. We're looking at elder care in, in particular, but this this is valuable pandemic or, or no pandemic because medical you know, institutions are, are typically understaffed. And so having having robots that can provide some emotional and, and social care and, and a, a, along with contributing knowledge and just observing the situation and doing simple physical things this is always valuable. But the, the fact that, that the robots have a less of a tendency to spread disease than, than human medical workers do of course, this just accentuates the interest in these things in a, in, a, in a pandemic period. I also think, you know, more generally, more generally, the pandemic is making businesses just restructure in, in, in general. They're needing to restructure their operations because they're, I mean, they're, their staff are, are working from home now. That they're they're moving toward outsourcing when they weren't in in, in, so, in some cases, or they're having to rethink their business models because of people's different patterns of behavior. But when you're restructuring your business, you often you know take into account a whole bunch of pending needs to restructure that you hadn't been been paying attention to. So that there's a lot of businesses that knew they had opportunities to incorporate AI in what they're doing, but they didn't do it just to, due to a sort of inertia. So now, you know, with the pandemic induced restructuring, it's like, why not, why not restructure in ways that will incorporate AI also, like while we're, while we're re reorganizing things. So there's a big opportunity here. The pandemic is, you know, it's, terrifying cost to, to so many people, but it's also an interesting opportunity for many, many businesses. I think uh, one of the challenges that the AI and the technology world faces in, in general in the response to pandemic is that, you know, much of the data that is increasingly going into AIs in the pandemic economy is going into AIs owned by a small number of, of very large tech companies, right? Like Amazon and Google are gathering an awful lot of, uh, of very valuable data. And the Facebook, Twitter, I mean, because more and more time is being spent in the in in these big, big company owned, owned uh, projects. So, and, you know, these large corporations have the cash to get through temporary shortfalls in, in, in revenue. They can offer things at a loss to themselves when, it, when it's valuable to do so. So most of the data, which is like the lifeblood of the AI, is, is going into the bank accounts of a few large, it's going, it's going into the hard drives of a few large, few large entities. And this is occurring at a time when, you know, the venture capital and investment world is also struggling with the pandemic. Not that there's not investment happening, but I think there's an increasing bias toward investors, you know, going into later rounds of existing businesses to make sure they can they can survive the pandemic and investing in people they know already, because it's hard to get to know new people through through Zoom calls and such, right? So you have you have big companies gathering a lot of data and able to weather the ups and downs of the economy better than, than SMEs. At the same time, you have you have VCs increasingly biased toward investing in, in later stage companies or in companies where they already know all the people, right? And so this, you, you have an environment 
where innovation is weighted toward uh, you know increasing the success of those who have already been been successful rather than on on helping you know new unknowns co come in and start start to grow and this this of course has to do with the theme of centralization versus decentralization which uh, which is key to our singularity net project where we're, we're using blockchain to create new mechanisms for a whole bunch of AIs made by perhaps smaller players to coordinate and, and combine to deliver functions rather than needing a whole army of AIs to be built just by one by one big big company. And I think, you know, this is going to be key, having not just singularity net, but any mechanism that can democratize and, and decentralize the AI economy is going to be key for, for a number of reasons. I mean, one is that it enables more creativity to come into the markets because even though these big AI companies have incredibly brilliant people in them, I mean, there's still a certain narrow thing that comes from all working for the same company toward maximizing shareholder value according to the same particular business model, you know, be, be it, be it uh, ad, ad, ad advertising or, or market prediction or whatever it is. And, you know, creativity is always needed in, in every niche of business. It's certainly needed in AI where you have a new technology revolution every couple of years. And the pandemic itself accentuates the need for creativity, right? Because the pandemic is a regime change, not just financially, socially, economically. It's it's a regime change in, in human society in so many ways. And if you have a narrow, narrow machine learning model trained on pre-pandemic, it's probably not going to extrapolate out of sample well to the pandemic and post-pandemic world. So we, we need neural symbolic AI. We need various transfer learning. We need various types of AI that are able to go beyond their training and experience and really generalize. And, and that's creativity and imagination. But this sort of creative AI, you know, it's at the cutting edge of AI R&D now. It's more likely to come out of a more creativity-oriented AI industry and, and infrastructure, which is probably doesn't mean one dominated by a handful of huge companies, but rather rather one with, with more with more different more different players in it, right? And this also to as a last comment, I mean this this ties in with the themes of you know ethics in AI and the fairness in AI and so forth. I mean not that not that large corporations are necessarily going to be unethical. They can do extremely beneficial things or or they can do un unethical things. But I, I think on the whole an oligopoly is probably not the best thing for eth ethics in an industry. I mean, there's a lot of pathologies that can emerge there. And I mean, you can, you can see the recent sort of tumult with the Google's AI, AI ethics division as, as an example of that. I mean, Google has probably been mo more ethical on the whole than most large corporations. On the other hand, like in the end, in the end, they're a big company with all, all the, internal and external pressures that, that come from that. And if we really want AI that's creative and imaginative as, as well as, you know, transparent, ethical, and, and the, you know, balanced in terms of gender and, and, and race and all these things. I mean, we, we, we probably want an AI ecosystem that's more broad-based, democratic, and, and decentralized. Pandemic has pushed us further towards centralization and ra ra rather, rather, rather than in a more inclusive ben i direction. need to interrupt you we need to uh go yeah to yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was that was my last point so thank you yeah thank you so much um and the next uh speaker uh is arana and i specifically would love to learn about your feeling from a business perspective because uh most of your time you're dealing with businesses uh your goal is to convince that ai help them to make businesses more efficient uh, how do you think, uh, do we have fears about implementation of AI? And how do you uh, justify and demonstrate its efficiency in order to sell uh, your product and platform and scale your business? How uh, COVID-19 uh, affect your niche? Yeah, thank you, Yona. Um, I think there were some really interesting points with uh, that Ben made there, um, especially like the the statement he said, pandemic is a regime change. I think certainly it's a regime change of mindset. I think it's a pretty powerful statement. Um, what we do, we, we're a deep tech AI company. We focus on deducing insights from the tone of voice. Um, we decipher a lot of signals, emotions, behaviors, 
and also some very advanced signals such as intent signals. Um, for example, what would the participant do in the near future? What action would the person take? Will the person buy or not buy? Or will the debt holder pay or not pay? And then we apply those capabilities into a variety of industry KPIs. So we're right in the thick of it. Um, I think, you know, let's talk about pandemic and AI. Um, I mean, one of the things is that we've talked a lot about AI and we've talked about sort of what AI is here to do and what it is not supposed to do, et cetera, et cetera. At the core of it, um, the essential job of AI and also the use of AI has been around automation, around augmentation and around enablement. And that has been really the stark reality. It's not really here to replace the humans, uh, at least not not yet. Um, it, it, we're quite quite further away from that reality at, at, at any point if that happens. And so what we've seen is that pandemic has created certain situations that have accelerated the trends that were already in place. Um, so some of the things around digitization, some of the things around automation were the areas that corporations and we as individuals were focused on for almost a decade or so. And uh, suddenly with the pandemic on us, we had to um, force ourselves to work in a different way, work, work in a different mode, incorporate different processes and uh, also accelerate the use of certain capabilities. And as a result, we've certainly seen a point of acceleration. In fact, you know, there was a recent KPMG study that I uh, that I read a week ago that talked about that AI not only has accelerated last year, it has accelerated too fast. And there has been a lot of concern that uh, the adoption has been unchecked and um, it hasn't necessarily been in the proper, uh, you know, tempered way that is good for us uh, in, in, in the long term. And I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to comment on that, uh, but I believe uh, certainly with those goals of automation, augmentation and enablement already in place, uh, we've seen, um, you know, this pandemic and this new way of doing things sort of force ourselves to uh, further leverage these capabilities. Right. So, for example, when you're talking about I'm just going to use a simple example when you're talking about working, uh, having your workforce distributed and remote and, and really essentially working out of their homes without necessarily in a team or a cohesive structure uh, and still be functional as an organization and allow your organization to have a relationship with your client base. Now you need uh, more tools, uh, more sort of touch points uh, to introduce empathy and manage experience and manage and monitor experience engagement. And so some of these aspects of conversational AI that were mostly sort of like, okay, you know, the second or third level of priority in a lot of companies became the top priority in these companies and they've accelerated with adoption. That's just one piece of it, right? But you could sort of apply that into any particular sector. Um, now, outside of that, there's another important point, right? So that's the one aspect, which is that, okay, there are trends in place which have now been accelerated because we're doing things differently. And then there's the other aspect of sort of where we are in general adoption of AI. And uh, we've been, you know, at this AI game for many decades now. It's not new. Um, but last decade was fairly important. I mean, what we have seen is that we're sort of now reaching uh, some points of inflection uh, in terms of availability of the building blocks, which is very unique uh, as how, the, you know, the way we start this decade. Um, for example, like if you take the general aspects of voice AI and conversational AI, um, you're, you're looking at uh, essential dynamics of NLP and NLU uh, all essentially solved for, also essentially commoditized. Like say about five to seven years ago, we were talking about speech to text and ASR or essential elements of NLP and NLU as being cutting edge and bleeding edge. And now fast forward into 2021, I mean, those are commoditized technologies. Those are readily available through multiple sources, often cheap and free uh, and very, very reliable. I mean, your NLP will, um, you know, uh, sort of measure uh, inflections in uh, any accents. It will, uh, it can, it can sort of, uh, you know, accurately process things in micro milliseconds and it's super accurate. So those problems have been solved for. Now, with these building blocks readily available, what's happening for the first time now is that you're now able to solve bigger problems. So now you could sort of take 
these building blocks of essential elements of like, I'm still take examples of uh, conversational AI, NLP, NLU, uh, and uh, now apply it together to go solve for maybe an aspect of experience, aspect of engagement. And so that is leading to the second points of acceleration where you're no longer solving for the core tech mm. that is available. Now you're looking at, you have a, you have a higher bar. You're looking at solving a larger business problem. And I think it's a fantastic time, uh, not only for entrepreneurs because, uh, they have a bigger set of, uh, options to play with, but also for investors and technologists because, you know, now finally you sort of are looking to, go into broader category of uh, experience management and engagement management. So I can go on and on, but I'll keep it brief here. Um, I think, you know, you know, from your question's perspective, um, there, there's certainly, you know, multiple factors. Uh, one, we're at, we are at a unique place of uh, the adoption curve in the AI uh, journey. And second, I mean, pandemic has created uh, certain accelerants, uh, which are even more exciting. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, now I would love to move to um, our next speaker, uh, Hussein. Um, you're focused on the uh, research and uh, technology innovation park uh, parks. Um, I spent significant time working uh, with the uh, Middle East uh, region in uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, Lebanon. Uh, amazing talent related to AI presented in MIT hackathons. Um, some of uh, my mentees have won these hackathons. Um, on your view, uh, which topics are typically presented by startups or projects in your innovation parks? Which social problems like mental health, education, learning, maybe climate change, uh, your alumni, students, and projects try to tap? How AI help them to solve these problems, which skills we try to uh, grow uh, and develop, and how you as an innovation ecosystem able to help them. Thank you, Yohan. Uh, first of all, I uh, represent the Sharjah Research and Technology Park, which is based in the UAE. It's a government initiative, and the objectives of this initiative is really to facilitate uh, uh, the relationship between government and private sector and entrepreneurs, as well as uh, academia. So we work on the triple helix approach to implement things. Uh, of course, the pandemic accelerated the uh, adoption and the promotion of AI. Today uh, at the park, we work hand in hand with companies and universities in developing, for example, uh, AI application to agriculture, for example, which is related to food security, which is a big topic for us in the Middle East uh, since we have a lot of desert. Another uh, topic that we uh, promote and we feel that there is uh, a, a, a big interest in is education. Education, of course, is transforming and AI will play a big role in, in, in education. Uh, retail experience is another uh, topic as well that, you know, with all these shopping malls and the shoppings that uh, is happening in the Middle East, you know, AI, I think, will play uh, a big role. Uh, having said that, I believe, uh, you know, we are witnessing uh, definitely uh, a, a big uh, boost in uh, the application of AI. However, I think there is there is a real gap that we need to keep uh, uh, in mind. There's needs for education when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, uh, I would say, you know, a good chunk, seventy percent of the general population, they don't know what is AI. They don't know what is the what is the what is the uh, uh, application related to AI and how AI can uh, help them and help their businesses, whether they are industries or universities. Or, or, or retail. So I think there is definitely a big uh, gap and there's a, a lot of awareness need to be done. And I think here where a uh, park uh, like us can play a role because we play a role of facilitator into bringing the knowledge of cutting edge of, 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 of companies and startups uh, to the government and try and private sector and try to facilitate, you know, this knowledge in, 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 in a way that is safe for all parties because as my uh, colleagues earlier spoke about, you know, AI ethics and, 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 and issues related with AI, the government created this platform to make sure that, you know, whatever we introduce into, into, the, into the country or into the city is monitored and is going through a channel that is safe as much as we can and that uh, basically are enabler to businesses. Of course, 
we do this through different means and 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 for example funding is one 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 mean where we uh, do invest in, in companies we also find investors to these companies but also we find them projects within the government as well so the whole objective of this park is really to create a platform for those companies for these technologies to be introduced in in, in a win-win uh, matter uh, thank you so much um and our next uh speaker uh is a uh, dr ori john um and i specifically interested uh in your perspective um from a scientific point of view. Um, over COVID-19, I had um, several great talks uh, with people who focus on smart cities, drug research, um, using of AI in order to accelerate vaccines research and so on. And unfortunately, then the pandemic happened. We were not prepared. Um, for instance, we had some solutions uh, focus on uh, information for citizens uh, or, or awareness or a drug research, but we were not prepared completely. So I would love to ask you, how do you think how AI is actually able to accelerate drug research, uh, high tech, deep tech research uh, in medicine, education, public agenda uh, from practical point of view in, in, in order to actually drive innovation. And the second question, how we able uh, to connect all of the dots of different stakeholders um, governors, uh, public and social organization to this discussion in order to uh, take uh, all of the point of view and align this development with the public policy and agenda. Uh, Yoa, thank you for um, uh, thank you for the introduction and this question. And I congratulate all of our uh, participants for their successful. Uh, endeavors in the space of AI, and it's, uh, it's a privilege to be um, amongst yourself. And uh, I also want to welcome our audience to this session. Um, FAST is uh, Foundation for Armenian Science and Technology, uh, sort of a quasi-governmental entity uh, focused on uh, education, research, and commercialization of science. And, um, you know, recently we... Uh, determined that we would want to have almost exclusive focus or predominant focus on AI in all of those uh, spaces as well when it comes to education, um, science, and commercialization. Now, there are two intriguing points or paths to follow when uh, looking at AI. You know, AI as a platform technology um, focused on fundamental scientific development of artificial intelligence, um, leading to something that is commonly known as artificial general intelligence, as uh, Ben was uh, referring a few minutes ago. And then there's the other part of AI as a technology solution um, that you integrate in various verticals, from agriculture to finance to education and governance. Here, we try to focus on both. Uh, one one commonality, and I think um, uh, you'll have a great appreciation here, uh, uh, you all in our audience, is uh, when looking into scientific part, uh, since 1950s, actually, when cultural assimilation of AI uh, uh, within the minds of scientists began, we have claimed that we are about 10 years away from uh, artificial general intelligence, beginning with Alan Turing and researchers around the globe bet on human ingenuity um, to overcome those challenges. Um, you know, it's like it's like every every decade we're saying we're a decade away, you know, and you know, naturally we have breakthroughs. And a couple of our uh, colleagues now spoke about you know major breakthroughs, and some of them um, uh, becoming uh, commodities over this last uh, ten years or seven years. Naturally, we have those. work, it would set you back about $200,000 a month or so. Now, I don't want to go into all of this, you know, it's like all of these things um, uh, we overcome one way or another, but today with big data and breakthroughs in computer science and mathematics or neurosciences, we find out through uh, the ceilings of Moore's law, uh, you know, doubling of uh, intelligence every two years. Actually, this uh, yesterday, actually, there was an article that came out uh, by Sam Altman, you know, uh, OpenAI, uh, you're probably familiar with this. So they forecasted uh, that in the next 10 years, 
uh, every uh, citizen in the United States or every adult citizen in the United States should be able to receive about thirteen thousand five hundred dollars um, a year uh, based on the wealth that would be generated in this space over the uh, over the years over this next ten years. Essentially, what they figured. The fifty trillion dollar in market values for all uh, companies and thirty billion dollars of land that is owned by people will double in the next ten years, and because of that, that wealth uh, could be shared with others. But I, you know, I, I want to also, um, you know, uh, come down uh, from these thirty thousand feet up to uh, basics. Um, you know, you mentioned something about uh, drug recovery and how medicine plays a role and how AI plays a role in medicine. You know, before pandemic uh, hit, for any drug company, for them to generate a vaccine or any kind of a drug, they would go through nearly about a decade uh, for experimentation, exploration, and what have you, and then go through a number of years of processes through FDA for them to get a vaccine approved. And imagine that, um, you know, we have three, uh, three, at least three FDA approved vaccines right now in the United States. But then we have, besides those, we have several other vaccines from China, Russia, and the United Kingdom that are approved in other parts of the world. And all of this was done in less than a year, um, which is amazing. Part of it could be dedicated to uh, how AI has been integrated into this. Uh, part of it is just deficiencies in the system, right? Um, you know, it's not possible for us to overcome all of those deficiencies within months, um, but we had to, we had a force for us to do so. There are deficiencies in exploration, there are deficiencies in technology creation, and deficiencies in company creation, as well as when it comes to approval process within the Federal Drug Administration and whatnot. One of our one of our areas that we look, you know, we are, we've created this advanced solution center that looks at a um, number of ways uh, we can create new companies, um, AI driven new companies that would that would generate value. And, and this is this is this is complete coincidence. But actually, the model that we're using here in Armenia uh, is the same model that generated uh, Moderna. You know, one of the vaccine companies um, that you know everyone around the world knows because the co-founder of Moderna is also co-founder of our foundation. So we, uh, you know, this is uh, this is a complete coincidence as to how all of this came to fruition. But we've established the same kind of an environment here. And um, again, within a year, year and a half, we came up with AI solutions that generate synthesizable molecules with uh, medicinal properties, which can be turned into drugs. So we're looking at both proteins and RNA. Uh, when I say we, I mean our algorithm does. Uh, instead of spending three, four years for research and synthesis, for instance, and spending uh, from several hundred millions, seven and hundred millions of dollars to a billion of dollars um, in, in expenses, those turn into savings. And then uh, so you, you save three, four years of time and billions of, billions of dollars uh, for you to go through this process only because you have a simple algorithm that does that with you, for you. And you only spend a couple of, couple of minutes, uh, in some cases, a couple of sentence, uh, seconds for you to generate molecules that could turn into drugs. We do the same thing on the other side of the spectrum, in AI for banking and AI for trading, and as well as solutions in other verticals, such as agriculture, uh, ag tech, ag tech and, um, and as I said, fintech. If I can stop here, and I know uh, there's more we need to discuss, uh, but what I want to say, um, uh, the last thing, pandemic really had us, um, you know, kind of put our creative hats um, uh, uh, creative hats on, on our heads, all of us, uh, every, everyone on this call, uh, just to become more creative. And I think artificial intelligence has become, has come to the forefront because of that too. Thank you so much. I would love to thank um, all of our today panelists. Uh, and since our time is limited, I would love to make a conclusion about all of the changes, all of the forecast uh, we uh, have uh, for now. First of all, um, I work in AI and I'm, work, I'm deal with patients, people with neurodiversity, health issues, and I need to connect all of the dots and all of this experiences, voices is a opportunity to come up with more solutions uh, and practical ideas. I believe uh, we still have uh, at least three or four key directions where we uh, could 
perform better uh, is the connection with us, all of our stakeholders uh, to the discussion, to the exchange of experiences, uh, is a research in academia world, is a venture capitalist, uh, is a technologist, uh, is a businesses in order to come from uh, buzzwords uh, to more practical uh, implementation. For instance, uh, when I talked to uh, AI uh, association in Africa, we said we don't need democratization of AI. We have the tools. We 